and rural outreach center, St. Louis, Missouri. That's the gateway to revival. Here is Pastor Priscilla J. Barris with another transforming message that will transform your life. What we're looking at tonight is God will put your enemies in derision. Now, uh, this morning, uh, when I was asking God about what to minister, because he hadn't given me anything before then, he said derision. So I had to, I was trying to figure out, okay, God, what direction you want me to go with that? And what I was remembering years and years and years ago, um, David Crank Sr., he's passed, he's gone on to be in heaven. But anyway, so he had came to our church, and he was ministered, and sometimes he prophesied according to scriptures. So he had prophesied this over me, morning by, and it's the scripture out of Isaiah, morning by morning you wake me up to hear with the, uh, the ear of the learned that I might speak a word in season to him that is weary. And so I know that this word is for someone that's weary or someone that's weary, and they're going through a lot of derision. They're going through a lot of mocking. They're going through a lot of, uh, for lack of better words, being a target by other people. And so we're just going to speak to that on today. So when we look at it, the first thing is those who live godly will suffer persecution. Now, there's a reason for that. Those who live godly will suffer persecution. And the reason for that is, is that darkness doesn't like the light. So when you're living godly, you're being what Jesus wants you to be. You're the, not only the salt of the earth, but you're being the light of the world. And when the light is turned on, what had been hidden in the dark is now clearly seen. And so people like for their works of darkness to stay hidden. They like for their works of darkness to stay in a place where nobody can see it, nobody can know it. Or they like for their works of darkness to be in a place where we're all together in this and everybody's doing it. But then when you see some, the light and then you find out everybody's not doing it. So they really don't like the light and that's why person, those who live godly will suffer persecution. Now, if your persecution is because of sin, Confess your sins to God. The Bible tells us in Proverbs, he that covers his sin won't prosper, but whosoever confesses and forsakes it will find mercy. And then also in 1 John 1, 8 through 9, the Bible says if we say we have no sin, we're deceived and the truth is not in us. But if we would confess, confession means what? To say the same thing. Don't blame other people uh, and just take a, hold accountability for your own, take accountability for your own sin in thoughts, words, deeds, actions, and attitudes. Don't try to blame anybody else. Don't try to blame the economy. Don't try to blame your spouse. Don't try to blame your children. Don't try to blame your co-workers. Don't try to blame all these different things people try to blame. That's not repenting. Amen. Confession means to say the same thing. If it's something that God calls a sin, we call it a sin. And, it, and then so confess our sins unto God and he is faithful and just to do what? Forgive us of what? all of our sins then he comes in and he cleanses us of all unrighteousness okay now so then it goes on here and it says receive God's mercy forgiveness and cleansing and change your playmates and your playground now I just I first heard that from uh, Dr. Burrs when he created the Tada curriculum about changing your playmates and changing your playgrounds and we have to see how important that is. The Bible says don't be not only don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And once we come into the body of Christ, so we, we have to make sure that we're not being unequally yoked with those that are unbelievers, okay? And then the Bible also says don't be deceived. Evil communications or evil companionships, they do what? They corrupt good manners. You're going one way you're trying to hook up with people going a totally different way and it's always going to be a tug of war okay and so to go ahead and 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 and, and be what you need to be we're going to have to do what make sure you change your playmates in your playground so let's go to second timothy 3 and 10 second timothy 3 and 10 and I do want to say, okay, with that change your playmates in your playground, the Bible says, how can two walk together except they be agreed? Once you commit your life to following the Lord Jesus, and once you get born again, the people who are willing to go the direction that you're going now, they're, they're coming to church. They're going to read their Bible. They're going to pray. They're going to, they're going to fast. They're going to, uh, to the best of their ability, by the grace of God, follow Jesus by his word and by the spirit of God. Okay, and so what happens is if, if, if you can be the influencer in the relationship and now that you've uh, become a new creature in Christ Jesus and you can influence them to follow you as you're following Christ, but having them to 
keep focused on Jesus because we making disciples is not to make disciples unto ourselves. Making disciples is to make a disciple unto Jesus. And so those that are willing to follow the, the same direction that you're going, pure hearted people, okay? What happens, they just want to follow Jesus. We don't have to have perfect people in our lives, but we need pure hearted people in our lives that or the desire is to walk upright and pleasing before the Lord, okay? And so, yeah, because some people, how are they really going to come to Christ? They don't even know, not to say it's impossible, but they don't know anybody to say. So if you, if, if you can be the leader in the relationship, well, it's all right to keep them because now they're just going the same direction you are following Christ. However, if you're not the leader, and I know this crushes people's ego, but if you're not the leader and what happens in conversations, they're talking about the old things or they're talking about sinful things and, and they're not interested in, in, um, in joining you in conversations about the Lord and about the good things that God is doing in your life and what you're excited about and what you're learning about the things of God, well, that, that's really not going to work because that's going to be a pull on you and that's going to keep you going backwards instead of going forward. Because you have to realize most people are more comfortable with the familiar. So when they get born again, they want to keep the familiar relationships, even if they're, they're dysfunctional relationships, even if they're wrong relationships. They want to keep them because they're familiar with them. But if we're going to follow Christ, we're constantly going into the unfamiliar, but it's good because it's greater than the, we could do without him. Everything in our life should be greater. Everything in our life will be better. And so, but what happens is people want to hang on to those relationships because they're just so comfortable with familiar. And then also when a person gets born again, the Bible says he that wants friends must show himself friendly. I had went to, uh, where was it? I was down here Monday. Uh, and what happened was, so I, for lunch I went to, uh, what is that, Curl, bowls and wraps or something like that. Crazy bowls of wrap, and it was good, okay? But anyway, so I ordered, man, I said ordered to go. But anyway, I said ordered, and I was waiting, and these two young men came in. They were new. I almost wondered if they were down here for spring break, checking out of college, or this was their first year there, or whatever. They, whatever, and I was talking to them. They started talking to me. They said, hi, how are you? I said, fine, but they sat over there, and I was over here, because I was waiting on them to bring my bag. And so what happens is they started talking, commenting on my jacket, said, oh, that's a pretty mauve jacket. I said, well, actually, it's white, pink, and black. But anyway... <laughs> And so we were talking, then I started asking about Jesus. We had a really, really long conversation, but they were new to St. Louis, so they were doing what? They were showing themselves friendly, okay? When we come to, the, uh, come to Christ, you know, we're new in this thing. Some people are blessed. They come in with family. They come in with friends. They have friends that kind of lead them to Christ and things. They're really blessed. And sometimes when they come in like that, they don't understand how different it is for people who didn't come through family or friends, okay? And so what happens is, once you get born again, you do need to change some playgrounds, the place you was hanging out at, and some uh, playmates, because a lot of times with that familiarity, well, it, it causes you to go back because that's all you're talking about is the old, okay? But anyway, and so show yourself friendly to some people. And then, too, if you've been saved a while, if you see somebody that may not know anybody, whether it's in church or on your job or whatever, and maybe whether they're saved or unsaved, reach out to them. And what? Because show yourself friendly. And so we live in a world now where people want to develop all of their relationships online. And they'll tell all of their business, all of their dirty laundry, all of that stuff. But in person, they don't, they don't want you to get too close. But people need the Lord, but people need people too. And so it helps them to develop right relationships when people that are born again, they begin to reach out to other people and show themselves friendly. And then people that are new in the body of Christ, they do what? They show themselves friendly as well. Okay? Now, let me get back to this. Okay, so here, 2 Timothy 3 and 10. 2 Timothy 3 and 10. And here it simply states, it says, but you have carefully followed my doctrine. Doctrine simply means teaching or Bible teaching. Manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions. 
which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra. And so, of course, he's saying the, uh, the persecutions and the, all the things he's done and how in the midst of it he was showing perseverance and, you know, the fruit of the Spirit, long-suffering faith. These are some of the things that are fruit of the Spirit that are on the inside of everybody when they get born again because that's the fruit of the Holy Spirit on the inside of a born-again believer. And then, too, he says uh, afflictions. So we were closing out the shut-in on Saturday morning because it started uh, Friday night at 7 o'clock p.m. through Saturday mornings at 8 a.m., so I say any praise reports, prayer requests, or words from the Lord. And one of the ladies who came forward to, uh, to give a word from the Lord, or something the Lord has spoke to, a word from the Lord, what happens is she's attacked with a disease. But what happens, she's attacked with a disease that you can, you can see, that you can see. And she got up and she... Um, she gave the word of the Lord, what the Lord had spoken to her, whatever, and then she went back to her seat. And so then after a while, I was closing up and I was doing a benediction. As I was doing a benediction, God just, just, just pulled me towards her. And I forgot what her name was, but I called her name. I asked what her name was, whatever. And then what God was saying was he said that her faith was speaking. And see what some people do when they get under attack financially, when they get under attack physically in their physical health, what happens is they, they draw back. And a lot of times Christians not understanding, they feel like, what's wrong with your faith? Why haven't you got healed in 24 hours? Why have you know, sometimes you get a manifestation in 24 hours. If you save, you are already healed. But there is a force that has attacked your body, but you are already healed. And so you drive out that force by the power of, of God's word. And the Bible also talks about how it's faith and patience to receive the promise, the manifestation of what you already have, etc. And so what happens is they, they draw back and then believers that don't understand that, you know, that's why you still keep going because you are in faith. Well, it's, it's even the way that they sometimes deal with them, okay? And so here he's talking about even in afflictions. There can be afflictions with your physical health, your mental health, your finances, afflictions in your family, afflictions that are job-related. It can come in a plethora of different ways. But he went through all that. Sometimes we forget where we are. <clears throat> yes, spiritually, we are seated in heavenly places with Christ. Naturally, we're on planet Earth. Amen. In the Gospel of John, Jesus tells us, he tells us uh, in this world, that's our physical address right now, even though we're just here as ambassadors for Christ. OK. And so it says in this world, you will have tribulations. Tribulations is what? Troubling times. He says, be of good cheer. I've already overcome them. That's in the Gospel of John. Then we go over to the first epistle of John around the fifth chapter. And it talks about everything that's born of God overcomes the world. How many people are born of God? Wave your hands at me, okay? All right. Anything that's born of God does what? Overcomes the world. And this is what overcomes the world, even our faith. Jesus even tells us, don't, don't treasure up things in the earth where, you know, the moth can corrupt and eat and, and the people can rob in and steal. See, we're on planet earth, so sometimes these things happen. And so people are just, uh, what's the best way to say? They're, they're, they're taken back, they're distraught because, oh, this happened. We forget where our address is. And so what happens is because Jesus is already overcoming, we can overcome it too. But don't get just, just I mean, just out of place and you can't deal with it. And it's just, it's just too much. And why God, why? Because you're in this sin-cursed earth. You are light in darkness. You're the salt of the earth. You are a target for demon spirits, especially if you follow in Christ for real, okay? And so these things happen, but you have the victory in these situations every single time. And so sometimes we forget where we are. And so this is the great apostle Paul wrote three-fourths of the, uh, the New Testament and, and, you know, was a mighty apostle of God, but he went through some stuff. So every other believer, you're going to go through some stuff. Jesus, our perfect example, he went through some stuff. And so what happens is people get depressed, they get discouraged, they get despondent because they went through something. Don't forget your physical address. Now you operate and live your life from the position of your spiritual address, being seated in high heavenly places with Christ. But when things happen because of your physical address, don't get despondent or don't get shocked. Or definitely don't say, oh God, why did, this have, why did this happen to me? My personal opinion, so you can put it in the trash. My personal opinion is that is one of the most selfish things that we can say. Why did this happen to happen to me? 
Because what we're really saying is, why did it happen to happen to me? That should have happened to Donisha. Why did it happen to happen to me? That should have happened to me a servant. That's what we're really saying. And so we have to understand, we are on this sin-cursed earth, and sometimes things will happen, but operating out of our spiritual address, being seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus, that's where we do warfare, and that's where we see ourselves in a position of victory. But things will happen, and you can endure it, and God will definitely deliver you every single time. And then it goes on. What persecutions I, what I endured. Sometimes nowadays what, what we call bullying could be uh, persecution as well. There are people that are bullied in their homes. There are people that are bullied in the school, the school that they attend or maybe even in the workplace. There are people that are, are, are bullied in, in an a, a arena of different places. And they're going through these things. People are laughing at them. People are mocking them. People are whispering about them and things like that. That's what derision is. And so it happens to people in different situations and circumstances. One of the songs that I presently really, really like, uh, it, it, part of the words is, you don't know what it's like to be me, and I don't know what it's like to be you. If people get the revelation of that, that will help them stop talking about people until their minds get renewed. Because you don't know what it's like to be anybody else but you. And so even the people that have this really, really ignorant saying, ignorant simply means not knowing, ignorant saying of, if I was you, I would do this. You don't know what it would be like to be them. And so you're saying you being who you are if you were them when you'll never be them. And you will never 100% know what it's like to be them. And then it goes on. What I endured, and out of them all, wait a minute, what persecutions I endured, and out of them what? All, oh, every single one of them. But what did he have to do? He endured until he got his manifestation. He didn't quit, he didn't throw in the towel, he didn't give up, he didn't walk away from Christ. He did what? He endured. He didn't care what people who didn't uh, know what it was like to be him would say, you know, just like they did Job, Paul, you know, you're going through all this stuff, you got to be in sin. What you hiding, Paul? You telling us uh, to be like you, live celibate, who you got? There has to be some hidden sin, Paul. You, you go through all this stuff, all these things that's happening to you, all these afflictions happening to you. Paul, okay, be honest. Confess your sins one to another. Here I am, Paul, tell, you can tell me. Because in our mind, when people go through stuff, oh, they must be having a hidden sin. Right. Right. And so it goes on here. And so because it was not hidden sin, just his, what, his, what uh, his address was physically, planet Earth, operating out of his spiritual address, being seated with Christ in heavenly places, being under attack for the, uh, by the devil because of how he was expanding the kingdom of God in the Earth. He went through a lot. But out of every single situation, God did what? He delivered him out of them all. Verse 12. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ will suffer persecution. And I really love this. They said what? All who desire to live godly in Christ. And see what happens is people may have the desire and they're, they're walking it out, they're walking it out, but as they're growing in grace, their actions may not line up with their desires at all times. And so what they're saying, but those who desire to do what? To live godly in Christ Jesus. At TCC, WOC at AOL.com. Or you can call us at 314-535-1176, extension 10, again, to order this week's broadcast.
Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Because people don't, some people don't, I'm not just talking about people that are not saved. Some people that are saved don't want you or don't want certain people sometimes to walk godly in Christ Jesus or have that desire. They want, they want to think that everybody that's born again, they're just carnal and in their flesh. And, and that's just, that's how it really is. That's not how it really is. There are people in the body of Christ that really love Jesus. And Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So then it goes on. Yes, and all, I just read it, all who live desire, I love it, desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer what? Persecutions. But evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And so out of all the things that he listed that he went through and how he endured, how he was long suffering, etc., he was, he, was, he was showing forth the fruit of the Holy Spirit on the inside of him as he was going through these persecutions, inflections, and things like that. And so then he talks about how God delivered him out of them all. But then he goes on to, to kind of, you know, also state the present state of the earthly address we have, but evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. I think with some people, the challenge they have with dealing with what is, even though they know they're going to get their manifestation and they're trusting God for a manifestation of what he has already done in their lives in various areas, they're trusting him for deliverance, they're tr trusting him for victor victory. Some people, it's like they don't have a real view of planet Earth. Now, when you look at the 1,000 year millennium reign of Christ on this present Earth, we're not there yet. Got some things to happen before we get there, okay? Or before that happens. Now, it talks about how Jesus and Isaiah, Jesus will rule with a rod of iron and the government will be upon his shoulder. And you can read certain scriptures in Isaiah where they're talking about that period of time on this present earth and how it's beautified and all this stuff. We're not there yet. We're not there yet. And so some people can't deal with what is, and you have to deal with this is what is. This is the environment that we're in. We bring the environment of the kingdom of God with us, but, it, you know, we should not think it's a strange thing when we have to deal with fiery trials that come to test us. And I think that's the problem or stumbling block for some people. They can't, you know, why did this have to happen to me? And how could this is happening? And why? Get past all this stuff. Don't, don't, even go, don't even get in that gear. Just get in the gear that's going to move you forward, not the gear that's going to keep you stuck. All right, let's go to, uh, we already quoted 1 John 1 and 8. And let's go to, and that's simply, if we say we have no sin, we're deceived. But if we confess our sins, unto, uh, if we say we have no sin, we're deceived and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins unto God, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins, cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So if our persecution is because of sin, we just need to repent, okay? And, and confess it and forsake it and receive God's mercy, forgiveness, and cleansing. Let's go to 1 Peter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1. First Peter chapter four, verse one. And here it simply says, therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, he suffered for us in the flesh when he hung on the cross and he was uh, shed his blood for us. And also when he took those stripes for our healing, arm yourself also with the same mind for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Okay, what do they mean by suffered in the flesh? Okay, now. So with Jesus, he was tempted in all manner as we are, yet with what? Without sin, okay? The flesh has appetites, the main appetites of the flesh. We know that our, our physical body is composed of uh, blood, flesh, and bone, okay? Now, but we have what we term the appetites of the flesh. And the appetites of the flesh are for food, sex, and pleasure okay there are some of the appetites of the flesh and so what happens is we suffer in the flesh by not giving our flesh what it wants we crucify our flesh so we can live godly as we desire to live okay so yes we need food 
We need food with calories. We need food with calories so we can get energy to burn so that we can, just like putting gas in a gas tank, so we have energy to burn so we can do the things that we need to do and we can do it in strength in our physical body, okay? But then I know sometimes we just think drugs, alcohol, sexual perversion is the only sins there are. There are also sins of gluttony. And so we eat, but we don't get into the sins of gluttony, okay? And then it goes on, and it states, uh, what we, not goes on, it states, okay, so we got over there, uh, food. And then the other thing is sex. God created sex. Sex is good, but sex is good inside of marriage. Outside of, uh, outside of marriage, God calls it sin and said those who participate will be under his judgment. The Bible says that marriage is honorable in all, and the bed is to be kept. In the original language, that's what it means. The bed is to be what? Kept undefiled. It's not that you can have an orgy, it's a free fall, you do whatever you want to in the marriage bed. No, the marriage bed is to be what? Kept. Oh, pure, okay? Uh, uh, kept undefiled. For marriage is honorable and all, and the bed is to be kept undefiled. But whoremongers, okay? Whoremongers are people that are not married, that are involved sexually with other people. And people feel like, well, well, you know, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm only with this one woman. I'm not, you know, if you're a man, I'm not with all these other women. Or if you're a woman, I'm just with this one man. I'm not with all these other. This is my boyfriend. What is boyfriend? A boy is an immature male. Okay? Now, and so people, you know, it, it, it's, it's kind of mind-boggling. They're in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, even 80s sometimes, talking about this is my boyfriend, this is my girlfriend. They need to grow up, you need to grow up, and get out of sexual immorality. All right? And then it goes on, food, sex, and pleasure. The Bible talks about there's pleasure in sin for a season. A season is a short period of time that soon ends. And so, of course, God wants us to have pleasure. When we go to 1 Corinthians, the sixth trapped, a chapter, the Bible, not 1 Corinthians, that's the 1 Timothy, the sixth chapter. I know sometimes I need to stop listing chapters and verses, but I like to do it to kind of help me remember where things are. But anyway, so anyway, 1 Timothy, the sixth chapter, when he's talking to the rich, what he says that, um, that we should not uh, go after those things, whatever, you know, in essence, out of Proverbs, he talks about money just flies, takes wings and flies away. But he's talking about the money that lasts, but we should trust in uh, the riches that God gives, the things that what God gives us richly to enjoy. Now, I didn't butcher that up so bad. I'm just going to turn there for a hot second, then I get right back here. Okay. All right. Just get there for one second because I just butchered it up so bad. This is what I was alluding to. Here in 1 Timothy, the 6th chapter, verse 17. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty nor to trust in uncertain riches. That's the part I was getting to. Trusting in, don't trust in uncertain riches. What you get from your paycheck, what you have in your bank accounts, what you have in uh, your other kind of accounts. We've got a variety of kind of uh, places way electronically and other ways we can have accounts of what we have okay and so what happens is don't put your trust in all this stuff that you have stored up which he's talking about is what uncertain riches okay and so what happens is but in who the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy and so God is not about us oh he doesn't want us to have pleasure he wants us to have pleasure and he wants he wants to give us all these things that we can richly enjoy but when pleasure is to the point where now um, it, it's, it's taking us away from God and the things of God we need to do in some cases it's even taking us away from things that we just need to do in the natural sense with our families or in the workplace okay but when any of these things get out of order well, then it becomes sin and it becomes a problem. And so we suffer in our flesh and that we crucify our flesh and we don't allow our flesh to do these excesses or these immoral things. We do what? We suffer in our flesh, not allowing our flesh to have its way. Okay? So let me go back over here. And then it says, I'll read it again. Okay. I start from the top. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself also in the same mind. For he who suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. You've crucified that flesh. That he no longer should live the rest of his time. Rest of his time where? On planet earth. In the flesh for the lusts of men. But for what? The will of God. Now that we're saved, we don't live our life for the lusts of men. You know, all the lustful things that people do. 
We don't live our lives for that. Now that we're born again, we live our lives for what? The will of God. Apostle Paul said, what? I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I, but Christ, he lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and he gave his life for me. And so Christ wants to live his life through us. So now we don't live our life, uh, pass our time in the flesh while we in these earth suits for the lust of men, but we pass our time here on this earth for the will of God to be done and allow Christ to live his life through us. Verse three, for we have spent... <clears throat> Enough time. So we have spent enough of our past lifetime. I love it. Past lifetime. Now that we save, once a person gets saved, the Bible says they're what? They're new creatures in Christ Jesus. Okay, so everything we did BC before Christ came into our life, that was our what? Our past lifestyle. It says, Behold, old things have passed away, all things have become new. Okay? So we have spent enough time in our past lifetime. To in doing the will of the Gentiles, who are Gentiles. Gentiles are simply people who are not in covenant with God. When a person gets born again, they're now in covenant with God, and we're under what? The new covenant. When we walked in what? Lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drunk, drinking parties, abominable idolatries. All the different types of things we were doing B.C. before Christ came in our life. That was in our what? Our, I like how he says it here, in our past lifetime. Okay? And so we were doing all this stuff. And then it says, in regard to these, and so that means once we get saved, we're supposed to stop doing all this stuff. And it says, in regard to these, I think it's, they, they think, the people that you left behind that was your old playmates, in regard to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. Okay, now, so when you begin to change your playmates and you begin to change your playgrounds, what happens, the old playmates, they're going to talk about you. They're going to put you in derision. They're going to be mocking you. They're going to be whispering about you. They're going to be laughing at you. They, in some places, they will be bullying you. And so what happens is, this is the norm. This should be acceptable. You should know these things are going to happen. When I got saved, got saved in the basement of my dorm. I was there for all the wrong reasons. It was having a meeting there. And when I came, it was for all the wrong reasons. I was a 19-year-old junior in college, uh, living here in America, speaking English, and nobody had ever shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with me. And the few times I personally remember going to church, it was, you know, you might hear something like the doors of the church is open, but I had no reference of that meaning anything about getting saved. My, my whole theology, my whole belief was, is that God made people. I believe God was real. God made people. God is in heaven. When people die, they go to heaven to be with God. There is a hell, and there's only one person in it. That's the devil. I had no understanding that people had a sin nature, that people had a sin debt that had to be paid. I had no understanding that the wages, the payment, the payday for sin was death, but the gift of God was eternal life through Christ Jesus. And there were two girls that were in my e economics class, and they were trying to do that friendship evangelism stuff, which was not working because I did not want to be their friend. <laughs> and what happened was, <clears throat> but they were praying for me. Those girls, because after I got saved, I hooked up with them. And every day after dinner, they would go into the chapel and they would pray. And they prayed for real. Okay? But anyway, so they made me their prayer project. So the first time that I heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, I received Christ as my Savior because my heart was already prepared because they had been laboring in prayer for me. Amen. All right? And so what happened was, uh, and then... Uh, uh, you know, it's the same thing spiritually that happens when anybody gets born again. Uh, the new birth, Jesus said, you must be born again. He told Nicodemus that in John. And then when you go to Titus, when it says the regeneration of the spirit, when you look at it in the uh, Greek dictionary, regeneration means what? Rebirth, the rebirth of the human spirit. So since because of Adam's sin, we all had uh, a sin nature and a, a sinful spirit, okay? And so once we get born again, we repent of our sins, we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, etc. What happens is, well then... 
there's a regeneration of the spirit or the rebirth of the human spirit. Because Jesus said you cannot put new wine, new wine representing the Holy Spirit, into old wine skins representing what? That old unregenerate human spirit. Okay? And so then the Holy Spirit comes in and he regenerates our human spirit, which is, according to the Greek dictionary, we call, they call it the regeneration, but it's actually the new birth. And then the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of us and we become that new creature in Christ Jesus okay and so what happens when I got say I went up there I couldn't wait for her to be quiet I just wanted to get up there once she really gave me the altar call and explained all this stuff to me I just was I just wanted to bolt up there so I came up there prayed the prayer I gave my life to Christ I still I could not stop crying and laughing and then I saw her hugging everybody in that service in that basement and people were saying we know something happened to Priscilla's because she doesn't hug anybody okay so then I go back upstairs and people think I talk fast now. I talk 10 times faster years ago than how I talk now. And so what happened was I was in my dorm room and everybody's coming to my dorm room to see what happened, whatever. And I was just talking, talking, talking. And when I was about to say S-H-I-T, shoot came out of my mouth. And when I was, I used to curse like a sailor. Okay, but anyway. And so when I, and then I was about to say uh, D-A-M-N and dog came out of my mouth. And so I'm like, I, I didn't know what's going on. And then I said something, they really thought I was nuts, right? The next night, some fell in my room and, you know, I was doing something. And then they said, well, she must be trying to hang up a cross. I got a lot of persecution. I got a lot of mocking. I got a lot of derision. I had, I got a lot of uh, whispering about me, but I was so glad. I didn't know too much, but I got saved. I didn't care about them people, okay? And so there should be something different. You know, because before, you know, after dinner, if somebody want, had a convertible, they wanted to ride me around. I was going. And I didn't give up nothing because I didn't want to get pregnant. But I, I'd ride, I'd get drinks from you, I'd get anything from you. But I'm not giving up anything because I didn't want to get pregnant. But anyway, I, unsaved, okay? But anyway, and so what happened was, so now after dinner, I would go into the chapel and pray. And these are the people that prayed and cried out to God, your eyes running, your nose running, everything you got is running. Crying out, praying or whatever. And so I, I began to change these two girls that were praying and interceding for my salvation, trying to do the friendship evangelism. So they never really explained salvation to me. They just tried to befriend me and I didn't want to be their friends. And so if you're trying to do the friendship, um, friendship, um, uh, trying to lead somebody to Christ through friendship, Put the, all, put the plan of salvation first. Okay? But they still prayed for me, even though I didn't want to have anything to do with them. They, the first, they weren't there tonight, I got saved, but they the first people I hooked up with. And so now I'm changing my playmates. I'm changing my playground. All right? And so with that comes mocking. Okay? And so what happens? People, people will mock when you change your, uh, you, they'll, you'll be put in derision. You'll be mocked. You will be whispered about. You will be laughed at. All these different things that go on. Some people, it's not even a situation of changing your playmates or your playground. They just decide to make you a target. That's where bullying comes in. Some people you can get under attack, physical attack, mental attack, a uh, financial attack, uh, 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 attack with your family situations, workplace attacks or whatever. And so what happened, people began to mock because they can't figure out why these things are happening to you. Okay. And so some people, they just don't like you. They don't like the way you look. They don't like the way you talk. They don't like the way you walk. They don't like whatever. It doesn't really matter. But what happens is, what God gave me the word derision, so that's what I'm dealing with on today. People have to make sure that they look past all of this and make sure that they're pleasing with God. And God will deliver them out of every single situation. All right, let's go on. And then it says, they, okay, uh, I'll read it again. In regard to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, okay, speaking evil of you. So you need to know when you really get saved, when you change your playmates and playground, they will talk about you. You need to know when you really get saved, you are supposed to change your playmates and playmates, your playground. Pray for them, love them, but go a particular direction. Now, if they want to run that direction you're running, that's fine. But if they're not trying to run the direction you're running, don't just go back to the familiar. But you run after Christ because it's much better what's ahead of you than what was behind you. Okay? And say, and they will give an account to him, which is God, who is ready to judge the living and the dead. All right. Second point, don't stop being obedient to doing and saying God's word 
even if it's causing you to be in derision, being mocked. Let's go to Jeremiah 20 and 7. Jeremiah 20 and 7. So here he's talking to God. He says, he's praying to God, Oh Lord, you induced me and I was persuaded. What Jeremiah was saying, I didn't sign up for this. I did not sign up for this, okay? Now, and so what happens is when we look at the book of Jeremiah, how it starts off in the first chapter, uh, God speaks to me. He says, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's belly, and I ordained you to be a prophet unto the nations. Now, then after that, uh, Jeremiah tried to pull the same, just excuses, like Moses tried to pull. So what Moses tried to pull, he said, but I can't speak. He can speak, but probably some people say he stuttered or whatever. We don't know what the real issue was, but he wasn't the most eloquent speaker, okay? So he said he couldn't do it. Then with Jeremiah, his excuse was, was a little bit stronger in that some say he was probably like a teenager, 17, 18, 19, somewhere around there. Okay, and what happens is in that time, and even in Judaism, what happens is you don't really speak. You don't have, in essence, you don't have anything to speak or to say until you get close to 30. Because if not, before that, you're supposed to listen to the older and the wiser ones. Okay, so now... And then two, uh, as far as being a priest, you couldn't even be, a, not because he was called to be a priest, but as a priest, you'd have to be 30 years old to be a priest. Okay? And so, but anyway, so what happened was, now God was calling him as a prophet. And he told him, I, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's belly, and I ordained you to be a what? A prophet to the nations. Okay? And so, he, he, he heard what God said, but he's thinking, how can I go to these people, and I am a teenager, or I am a young person, young adult, and they, they're not going to receive me as having wisdom or even perceive me as uh, being eligible to speak to them. And then he said, don't be something about don't be moved by their faces. And he says, if you don't say what I tell you to say, I'm going to confound you. And so he didn't give him an excuse. And so here Jeremiah is saying, oh, Lord, you induced me. I didn't sign up for this. And I was persuaded. See, God can deal with us about different things that he wants us to do that might not be what we want to do. But he knows how to tug on our hearts. He knows how to melt our hearts. He knows how to draw us in. And then as he probably, as he grew to love the Lord more, he was persuaded to go ahead and do what he wanted him to do nevertheless. He says, the Lord, you induced me and I was persuaded. You are stronger than I and have prevailed. He was saying, this wouldn't have been my choice in life to be a prophet to the nation to be in derision, to be mocked, to be whispered about, to be laughed at. Th this was not my choice in life. This was not my career path. <clears throat> and have prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocks me. Verse 8. For when I spoke, I cried out, I shouted, violence and plunder. And so you have to understand, because of the wickedness that was going on among the people, uh, that God was sending prophet, he wasn't the only one, but God was sending prophet after prophet to, to call out the sins of the people and to warn them about impending judgment if they did not repent. And so a lot of times the words that God would give them, just like I was dealing with on Sunday, part of the message, out of Romans, the 12th chapter, and they were talking about the different gifts. Some of them were the manifestation gifts of the Holy Spirit, and then some dealing with the certain offices, etc. Some of them service gifts, etc. But when we were dealing with prophecy and the word, the interpretation was that the, uh, the prophetic word or the prophetic office, and what I was saying, uh, the definition was it was not anything that you thought of. And so it doesn't emanate from your thoughts. It doesn't even emanate from your heart. This is just what God speaks through you and what God gives you to speak, okay? And so God is giving him all of these words to speak about the violence and the plunder, and the people don't want to hear it. They want to stay in the sinful state, the sinful situation that they're in. They don't think anything is wrong with how they're living. And that's just like here in America. When anybody talks about the sinful nature of America, and even that America is worse than Sodom and Gomorrah, well, people think, it's nothing wrong with America. And we are, this nation is so very perverse, rebellious, violent. All the reasons in which Sodom and Gomorrah were, was destroyed for, we take it to another level. But there are so many Americans, they don't believe it. Just like the people here. They don't believe it. 
And so then he goes on here. And because the word of the Lord was made to me a reproach and a derision daily. It brought about what? People mocking him. It brought about what? People whispering about him. It brought about what? People laughing at him. And then it goes on and it says... Because the word of the Lord was made to me a reproach, a derision daily. And then I said, I will not make mention of him anymore. He said, I'm out. I'm not going to continue this. I'm not going to continue to be a target. I am out. I'm not going to do this anymore. Verse 9, then I said, I will not make mention of him again. Because that's where all the trouble comes from. That's where the mocking comes from. That's where the whispering comes from. That's where being the laughed at. That's where the target comes from. And there are a lot of Christians, they won't witness their faith in the marketplace, in the schoolyard, or, or anywhere else because they just feel like people just make fun of them. So they're just, be quiet. And the only person who wins like that is the devil, a demon. Right. Then I said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in my heart like a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary of holding it back and I could not. For I heard, uh, for I heard many mocking, fear on every side. Report, they say, and we will report it. All my acquaintances watch for my stumbling, saying, perhaps he can be induced. Induced what? To stop speaking on the behalf of the Lord. And we will prevail against him, and we will take our revenge on him. Verse 11, but the Lord was with me. Amen. And this is what we have to understand. As I started off with, you know, nat spiritually, our address, we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. But in a natural sense, we are here in planet Earth. Get over the things that happen here in this sin curse. Just get over it. And focus on the Lord being with you. The Lord great and mighty. The Lord strong in battle. The Lord Jesus who said he would never leave us nor forsake us. The one who said he's our healer. The one that said he's our deliverer. The one who's the baptizer of the Holy Ghost. The one who will prosper us. The one who will bring restoration into our life. We keep our mind on him. We keep our thoughts on him. We focus on him. And the rest of the stuff, just let it pass. Just, just let it go. But the Lord is with me as, the, as a mighty and awesome one, bigger than all your problems. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble and will not prevail. They will be greatly ashamed, for they will not prosper. Their everlasting confusion will never be forgotten. Okay? What does the Bible say? Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that sows to the flesh. When you're putting people in derision, you're mocking them, you're whispering about them, you're laughing at them. What happens is you're sowing those seeds of the flesh, you're going to reap what? Corruption. That's what's happened to them. And then it goes on, but he that sows to the spirit will reap what? Everlasting life. Never stop focusing on where you're going. Destiny purpose don't get caught up in all this little stuff around here stay focused on where you're going stay focused on assignment stay focused on the reality of christ stay focused on who he is stay focused on who you are in him stay focused on these things and all this other stuff just let it pass people have left jobs people have left all kind of things that god has blessed them with because they couldn't get past people Forget about people. Love them, pray for them, forget about them. Don't focus on the people. Focus on God. Focus on your assignment. Focus on the great and mighty one. Focus on your healer. Focus on your deliverer. Focus on your baptizer in the Holy Ghost. Focus on the God mighty in battle. That's who we need to focus on. So you don't get robbed of your rewards. Let's go on. Let's go to Romans. 12 and 17. We were just at Romans, the 12th chapter of the weekend, but we went to some of the earlier verses. We read through those. Okay, Romans 12 and 17. Repay no one. It doesn't matter who it is or what they've done. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends upon you. So we, we can't, we can't, 
change other people. God can change them if he allowed them to, but we can't change other people. So to get a situation peaceful on our part, we're to do what we need to do to bring peace into the situation, but that's as much as we can do because it still depends upon the other person whether they are willing or open to a peaceful existence or a peaceful circumstance with you, okay? If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceable, peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves. But rather give place to wrath what is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And so when we try to fight our own battles, God just stands back and watch. But when we just let, when we repent, we forgive people, we just let it go. Well, then God steps in and he does what? He fights our battles. He says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil. We live in what? A sin-cursed earth. Jesus says, in this world, you will have tribulations. What's that? Troubling times. Be of good cheer. I've already overcome it. Then we go to, that's in the Gospel of John, 1 John 5, anything that's born of God overcomes the world, and this is what overcomes the world, even our faith. These are the things that we need to be understanding. We don't need to be entangled in strife. We don't need to be entangled in division. We don't need to be entangled in, you know, trying to get our way and, you know, make somebody, you can't make anybody understand, you can't make anybody get on your side. It's just really amazing. Well, I'll just leave that one alone. Let me stick with this, okay? So do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Final point. God will put your enemies. And of course, I don't even like the term enemy. For us as born-again believers, we should not really truly, in my opinion, have enemies. But when I was doing this message, it's just kind of those were the type of things that were coming up. Okay? God will put your enemies in derision if you do what? Trust in him. Let's go to Psalms 2 and 2. Psalms 2 and 2. And it says, it says, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heaven shall laugh and the Lord shall hold them in derision. Okay, now, so when we look at this and then it goes on the five, it says, and he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them and distress them in his deep displeasure. Okay, now, this is really talking about Jesus doing his, his uh, pretty much his 1,000 year millennium reign and then also partially that time when they try to rebel against it at the end. But the key issue, what we can take away from it is that he who sits in the heaven, he's going to laugh. When people come against you, you have to remember, when you got born again, you didn't, you didn't just join a religion or you didn't just pick a, 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 a faith to be a part of. You know, some people say, oh, I'm a part of the Muslim faith or I'm a part of this faith or I'm a part of that faith. No, you got born again. You got translated out of the kingdom of darkness where the devil was your daddy, where he came to steal, kill, and destroy from you. And you got translated into the kingdom of light where God Almighty became your father. And every good and perfect gift comes from above, comes from the father of light. And when you see when his son, now Jesus was uh, the son of God uh, by birth, okay? But what happened was birth of a, a virgin birth, etc. However, we born again believers, we are his children by adoption. So when God's child got on earth, being God himself as well, got on earth, well, when he was born and he had to be moved because, you know, they were trying to kill him because we won't go into details about that. Just read the Gospels, you find out. But anyway, so and they were trying to kill him. He had to be moved to go to Egypt. So his stepfather in the earth was Joseph. And Joseph was a carpenter by trade. So to protect the family, the angel told them to go to, uh, told them to go to Egypt. Okay, now. And so what happened was, so the same night that the angel told him that, that day, that's when the wise men, the Magi, got there with those gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. He was no longer the babe in the manger he was now the toddler the young child in the house and because of the move God didn't want his child in the earth to have any lack 
And so what happened, he dealt with the hearts of these kings in the east who had been influenced by Daniel, a prophet, for his godly lifestyle. And so that's how they knew the scriptures and that's how they knew different things from, uh, from Daniel's lifestyle. And so what happened, these kings from the region where Daniel had his ministry, what happened was they came, his ministry was in government actually, but anyway, they came and they brought these gifts. It wasn't because it was his birthday. It was because he was about to be moved to Egypt and his, his stepfather was a carpenter. He wouldn't have clientele. He was leaving out of jewelry with other Jews and things like that. He was going to have to go to a different place. He didn't want his son in the earth to be in lack. And so he had gold, frankincense, and myrrh brought all the way from the east. The day you got born again, you became a child of the Most High God. And God will take care of you. He will bring people from the east he will bring people from the west he will bring people from the north he will bring people from the south to bless you to provide for you to take care of you as the hand of God moves you are not you are not forsaken and you should not be in need because you have a father in heaven who will fight your battles you have a father in heaven who will take care of your needs you have a father in heaven who is not a deadbeat dad you are taken care of Lord. Let's go to Psalms 5 and 11. 5 and 11. And here it says, but let all those who rejoice, who put their trust in you. It doesn't matter what you're going through. It doesn't matter what has happened. It doesn't matter different situations. It doesn't really matter. We can rejoice if who put their trust in you. If we're putting our trust in God, we can rejoice in every situation because we know that we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. He's going to bring us out. We can rejoice. Let them ever what? Shout for joy. Regardless of what's going on in your finances, regardless of what's going on in your health, regardless of what's going on in your family, regardless of what's going on the, in the workplace, regardless of what's going on in any realm or any area of your life, you can shout for let those who love your name be what? Joyful in you. We can be joyful. And the joy of the Lord is our strength. Verse 12. For you, O Lord, will bless the righteous. And with favor, you will surround him as with a shield. And so when times in your life, maybe, maybe you're in derision, maybe you're being mocked, maybe you're being whispered about, maybe you're being laughed at, maybe you're being bullied. Bullied online, bullied in school, bullied in the workplace, bullied at home, bullied wherever. But you have to realize you have a God who will not only defend you and protect you, but you have a God in the midst of those who mock, in the midst of those who whisper, in the midst of those who laugh at you. God does what? He surrounds you as a shield with favor. People who don't know you, people who have never met you, now they begin to bless you. They come from the east, they come from the west, they come from the north, they come from the south. God begins to open doors for you that no man can close. And so our responsibility is to stay joyful in the Lord. Stay joyful and trusting in him because he will do what? He will surround the righteous with favor. When you have favor with somebody, they'll do for things for you they wouldn't do for their own mother. That's the favor of God. And that's what he will surround the righteous with. So don't, don't get caught up in what people can do with, for you because it's very little. Get caught up with the vastness of what God can and will do for you. Amen? All right. And so, you know, usually when I do a message, I like to find uh, an example in the Bible, but it's going to be too long. Keep us here too, night, too long. So <clears throat> on your own time, you can just read Esther chapter 2, verses 20 through 23, and then the rest of Esther, uh, chapters 3 through 10. And there it talks about, for lack of better words, the exchange bef between wicked Haman and Mordecai. You see what God will do. But let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here tonight, and we're so glad that you are. You're watching online, and we're so glad that you are. And you have never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. He is the Savior of the world. He died on the cross of Calvary to pay the price and the penalty for our sins. Sin always comes to the price tag. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. 
But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. God loves you, and he loves you with the everlasting love. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but would have everlasting life. God wants you to have everlasting life with him for eternity, and he wants you to have abundant life here now. He wants you to come out of that, that kingdom of darkness where the devil is your daddy, he comes to steal, kill, and destroy you. He wants you to receive Christ as your savior where you get translated out of that kingdom of darkness, and you get translated into the kingdom of God, the kingdom of light, and every, where every good and perfect gift comes from above, comes from the father of lights. See, he wants to now not only be your creator, he's the creator of every human being, he's the creator of everything and everything belongs to God but now he wants to become your father and that you can only become your father when you receive his son Jesus came preaching repent ye and believe the gospel repentance is simply a change of mind and a change of direction and the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 7 and 10 it's godly sorrow that leads to repentance to salvation that's not to be repented of and so what God wants, he wants you to just be sorry for the lifestyle that you live. Some type of remorse for how you lived your life apart from him. And make the decision to turn from that direction, to turn, to surrender your life, to follow him. Follow Jesus all the days of your life, believing that he's the only way to God, believing that he hung on the cross and he shed his blood for the payment of your sins, believing that he was uh, buried and he was resurrected. And the Bible says we simply believe it in our hearts and confess it with our mouths. We'll be saved. If you're here tonight and you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, or you're watching online and you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want you to pray this simple prayer with me, but it needs to be a heartfelt prayer. And just repeat after me, please. Making decision that you want to surrender your life to following Jesus the rest of your life. This is what this is. This is a commitment prayer. It's a prayer of faith, but it's a commitment to follow him all the days of your life. The Bible says that, oh, so just, just repeat after me. God, I come to you now as a sinner. I'm sorry for my sins. And I turn away from them. Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I want to follow you all the days of my life. I believe that you hung on the cross and you shed your blood for the payment of my sins. That you died and you were buried and you were resurrected. I believe it in my heart and I'm confessing in my mouth. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving me and making me whole. In Jesus' name, amen. If you pray, if you're watching online, you prayed that prayer for the first time, there should be an address, an email address on the screen, tccwc at aol.com, and a phone number, 314-535-1176, extension 10. If you would please take the time to reach out to us, uh, you can leave a message on the phone or you can email us, and we want to send you some information, and we want to pray with you, and we want to help you in your new journey, your new walk in following Christ. God bless you all, and thank you for listening. All right, those that are still here, let's keep our heads bowed. If you're here and you've not been 